Good evening, Commodore, and you all, friends and family of the America's Cup. The squadron's Commodore, Aaron Young, our host tonight, will now say a few words. Aaron. Thank you very much, Bruno. Ladies and gentlemen, kia ora. Good evening and welcome to the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, still home of the America's Cup. <laughs> to uh, President Bill, to Stephen as chair of the selection committee, I'm sorry you couldn't be with us tonight, but just so you know, Auckland's a pretty good place to be at the moment. Past inductees, the selection committee, distinguished guests of which there are many in this room, welcome to the club tonight to celebrate not only the 24th induction to the America's Cup Hall of Fame, but also the conclusion of the 36th America's Cup, as it turns out. To have so many America's Cup legends here, past, present, probably not so many future, but it's truly special. And we probably got lucky with our timing because this was postponed about two weeks. But as we sometimes say in sailing, better be lucky than good. Makes this event particularly special for me to have one of our Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron life members and club advocate, PJ Montgomery, recognised for his involvement in the America's Cup. Congratulations also to Ed Baird, a great friend of this club, and, and I believe he, he virtually started his professional match racing career here a number of years ago. And I've still got a book uh, on my shelf. I don't read much, but he's got, I've got a book on laser racing that Ed was a world champion in, and I've still got it sitting there. I don't use it anymore. But, um, look, and that's where sailing often starts. It's at your local yacht club. And as we say in New Zealand, grassroots, club sailing, is where it begins for many of us. And without your local yacht clubs, our sport, and all of us in this room are here to support the sport of yachting. Um, the sport can't grow and inspire so many others to go on and participate in such events as the America's Cup. So aside from being host tonight, it's our 150th year, our sesquicentennial year. 4,000 members, we run racing every day in summer. I'd just like to recognise our own staff who put a a lot of effort into tonight, the club volunteers, the course marshal volunteers who are out on the water every day uh, and big days, long days throughout the whole event, the race management team and everybody here who played a part in the success of the 36th America's Cup. It'd also be very remiss of me not to acknowledge our own team, Emirates Team New Zealand, for their victory on Wednesday that ensures the Cup just stays normally upstairs but we all look forward to being involved in the 37th America's Cup. Well done, Emirates Team New Zealand. <laughs> and finally, from me, thank you to Prada, presenting partner for the 36th America's Cup. We all know partnerships are necessary, and without Prada's support and help to run this event, it wouldn't have been such an outstanding event that Auckland's just seen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight. Enjoy yourselves. Celebrate two America's Cup legends and the conclusion of the 36th Cup. Thank you. I would like to mention all the names of uh, all the all famous present in this room. Tom Schneckenberg, Brown Zimmer, Warwick Flurry. Ken McAlpine, Sir Michael Fay, Murray Jones. So congratulations for being a part of the Hall of Fame. The Irish of Marine Museum is in Bristol, in Rhode Island. It's a part of the America's Cup history. The museum was created 50 years ago by all the Irish of, exactly 50 years ago. And uh, this is exactly where the eight of successful defenders of the America's Cup were built, designed by, Oze, by, the, by uh, Nathaniel Ereshoff between 1893 and 1934, eight successful challenges. So the Hall of Fame is part of this museum, it's 40 years old, and uh, 
it is uh, has been created to recognize and celebrate all those individuals who have made outstanding contributions to yachting Holy Grail. The money raised tonight, if any left, will help the Hall of Fame and the museum to survive because it's a tough time there. And uh, Steve Tushia is uh, head of uh, the Hall of Fame, while Bill Lin is the chairman of the Renaissance Museum. Thank you to them. Without them, there will be no evening tonight. Thank you. The America's Cup will not be here tonight without the vision of Sir Michael Fay when he launched a challenge in 1986, the New Zealand first challenge, Plastic Fantastic KZ7. Sir Michael, come on stage. Thank you, Bruno. I've never been under such tight instructions in my life. Um, and I'll tend to observe them, though. Um, it was an op going off to Fremantle. Thank you, PJ, again. And again and again, a million thanks, or maybe more. Um, we didn't, we, we looked at it carefully and we thought it could be done. Um, and we sort of had a vision of what could happen if we were successful and what would happen in Auckland on the waterfront. Um, but what we've just seen on the waterfront in your wildest dreams in the defence and successful defence of this America's Cup and the match itself, you couldn't have dreamt of in, in all that time. You would never, ever, you would have been drinking far too much to think that this is where we will end up if we come out of Fremantle successfully. Well, we didn't, but we were very, very close. Um, and I think with the Hall of Fame, Bruno, it's a wonderful, he, he asked me to talk about it. Um, it is a special tradition. Um, it was started, I think, in 1992, and they went all the way back to the very beginning. Um, interestingly enough for me, um, George Shiler, who was one of the three owners of the America's Cup, um, and who was the last one alive and who wrote the third deed of gift, he was inducted into it. Um, so you're going back to the very, very beginnings. There are only, I think, 91 inductees in the America's Cup, and when you look at the list, they represent all the historic figures um, and the important people all the way through the New York Yacht Club, the defences, the matches, everything else. But right now, today, with PJ in, inducted also, and we talk about our role in the Cup, we're still the smallest country ever to challenge, and we've been the most influential factor, I think, since we arrived in Fremantle. And of those 91 members of the, uh, uh, excuse me, of the Hall of Fame to, today, 11 of them are Kiwis. So if you think that there was no Kiwis in it all those years back, and now I think we might, we're not the majority, it'll be hard to beat the Americans, but we're on our way at 11 out of 91. When, um, and before I sit down, um, I acknowledge BJ's involvement over all that time and his enthusiasm, um, and it never waned all the way through and have become a great friend and a great guy to see all the time. So congratulations to you and your family, because this is not overdue, but extremely well-deserved. Thank you. PJ, now, one more boat for you. He's, he's, he's going to pull me off by my coattails in a moment. Um, when you look at what happened in Auckland here, um, and you see the, the number of people out, and you realise just how popular this has become in this country, uh, then you look at, I'd have to pay a personal tribute to Grant Dalton briefly. Um, there's only three people who have had that job um, since 1985 uh, or thereabouts. I'm one of them, so I've got some insight into it. Uh, Peter Blake is the second one, um, and I had a fair bit to deal with Peter. Um, neither of us liked the job. It wasn't a good job. It was a very hard job. You know, I've done a few difficult things, but that's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and we together clocked up 16 years. Grant Dalton took over in 2003, and he has clocked up 21 years in that job. <laughs> and, to, and to finish, Bruno, just to put it in perspective, uh, David Richwhite has lots of people out on his boat. You would have heard um, his boat all through the regatta. Sean Fitzpatrick was there the other day, flying the flags. 
He's very involved in sports promotion through Europe with L'Oreal. And he and his wife have been everywhere. And he said to David, in his experience, Sean Fitzpatrick, this is the greatest sporting event he had ever been to. So there we are, team, New Zealand. Thank you, Michael. So Nati Fatua Wakai, the host Iwi, have played an integral role in this America's Cup 36 success. I've asked Tiawa Alec Hope, my friend, to say a few words. Alec. Kia ora mai tātou, katoa. Le rangatira mai, e pae ama, honoured guest, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou, katoa. On behalf of Ngāti Whātua, o rāke, I welcome you all this evening on the shores of the Waitamata, the meeting place of many waka. As host Iwi, our vision for AC36, along with Emirates Team New Zealand, and Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli was to share our Māori culture and to make this a new, uniquely Kiwi event with that Italian Prada flair. And I think we were rather successful in doing that. Congratulations, Team New Zealand. It was a great event. I'd like to think that our gifting of the name Te Rehutai, which means, um, which means water spray, may have contributed to that success on the water. We all share love and respect for the seas and our historical voyages on it. There's a Māori proverb I'd like to end with. He aha te mea nui o te au. What is the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, it is people, it is people. And tonight are two people who have well earned the mana and respect of the international sailing community. Congratulations to the recipients, Peter Montgomery and Peter Beard into the America's Cup Hall of Fame. Kia ora mai tātou katoa. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We in New Zealand know him as the voice of yachting. Probably the world knows him as the voice of yachting. He's done an immense amount not only for world sailing, but a huge, huge amount for this club over so many years, and that's why he's a life member of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. PJ is a far better talker than I am, so I'm going to let him take over. PJ Montgomery, our next time. Can you come join us, PJ? San Diego, May the 13th, 1995. The creation of a legend. That call cemented PJ Montgomery as the voice of the America's Cup, but he'd long been the voice of yachting. Since 1970, PJ has called the action on TV and radio in all forms of sailing. The French yachts Creteur and Charles Heidseek are first and second, with the Dutch yacht Flyer third. In offshore racing, PJ reported on 13 round-the-world races and most of the classics, including the 1984 Sydney Hobart, which he sailed on Peter Blake's Lion New Zealand. We thrashed and bashed our way for the next three days that are still rate the worst three days of my life as we saw liquid Himalayas again. And PJ was in England to call Steinlager 2 across the line as the fastest boat on all six legs. <laughs> PJ's voice has provided the soundtrack to Kiwi achievements at 10 Olympic Games, notably Russell Coote's gold in 1984, ahead of his five America's Cup wins but it is the America's Cup which has been the mother load for this extraordinary career. Australia choose victory in 1983, seeing PJ smitten. Four years later, PJ was in living rooms all over New Zealand, relaying the story of the first Kiwi Challenge, the plastic fantastic finally falling to Dennis Connor. And it was an absolutely magnificent effort for the New Zealand to be able to get to the Louis Vuitton final. 
Connor going on to enjoy an epic comeback with Stars and Stripes. PJ once again waxing lyrical. If the film Rocky had been about yachting, there'd be no need for fiction. The Dennis Connor story is about the first skipper to lose the America's Cup and now the first skipper to win back yachting's heavyweight crown. PJ chronicled the big boat fiasco in 1988 as Connor's catamaran cruised over KZ1. And he saw the Kiwis fall short again with NZL20 in 1992 against the Italians. Italy are doing the job. Coming from 1-4 down, they are now going to beat New Zealand. The Italians then coming under some famous heat themselves from the Americans. But the pressure's gone on them. The blowtorch on their wide fronts and their eyes are starting to water already. The scorched underpants duly presented. Peter Montgomery, thank you very much. Oh, marvellous stuff. Well, I'll put that on my wall in my study. <laughs> Bill Coke's America Cubed eventually triumphed. International sports, hold the prize, stays in San Diego. And then in 1995, it finally came together for Team New Zealand, but not before some serious drama with some well-deserved Montgomery hyperbole as one Australia sank. The boat is bending like a banana. This is Yachting's version of the Titanic. Fast forward two months and cue that career-defining call. The America's Cup is now New Zealand's Cup. Modified notably on home waters in Auckland in 2000. The America's Cup is still New Zealand's Cup. There have been variations on the theme at all five America's Cups since. Malingi's victory in 2003. Sailing's biggest prize has a new home, Switzerland. The two-second win in Valencia in 2007. And Lingi has done it! And the Swiss cat losing to Oracle's try in 2010. The America's Cup is America's again! He called Oracle's rebound in San Francisco. The improbable, the incredible comeback. And the Kiwi's revenge in Bermuda. Once again, the America's Cup is New Zealand's Cup! And he continues calling this his 13th cup. And stand by, Maritime Ballet. PJ Montgomery, MBE and former New Zealand Yachtsman of the Year, the voice of the America's Cup, is still the voice. We came up with an idea tonight. We have asked Kate to talk about her father. Kate, come in. Hello. So when Bruno asked me to introduce Dad tonight, he told me I needed to keep it short. So I will now attempt to be the first Montgomery to ever speak for less than four minutes. We keep being told these are unprecedented times, so miracles might happen. If a picture paints a thousand words, I've always said Dad's motto is, I'd rather use the thousand words. <laughs> might be a family trait. But honestly, what a picture he can paint. His ability to bring his signature light and shade to commentary has delighted fans for almost four decades and brought so many new fans to sailing in that time. I can't count the amount of times people have told me that he could make grass growing or paint drying sound exciting. As his daughter, I don't necessarily agree with that, but perhaps on light air days, while we hurry up and wait, he's got close. His love for the cup, for its history and its present is infectious. And it's his ability to explain to sailors and landlubbers alike, speaking to his little old lady with the blue rinse in Riverton, that has made him synonymous with the America's Cup. So much so that he's known as the voice of the America's Cup. But you know all this. What you probably don't know is how dedicated Dad has always been to his craft. The countless hours behind the scenes spent researching or deciding on crucial moments, how a line should be said and when it should be delivered. I saw it in 1995, the night before the America's Cup became New Zealand's Cup. In 2017, I had the privilege of producing his radio show in Bermuda. 
time and again. I was stunned by his ability to find the right words for the right moment. And also all those little signature mod commentary ad libs out of thin air. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that dad is the reason New Zealanders and so much of the world know about the America's Cup. Or even the reason that New Zealand is in the Cup. After all, Sir Michael likes to remind dad very often that dad has cost him a lot of money. <laughs> but I'm biased. So when I set out to write this speech, I outsourced some of it. Our fellow America's Cup Hall of Famer, who is here with us tonight, Bradley William, had this to say. PJ's dedication to sailing has put New Zealand on the sailing world map. Without him, I am unsure if many of the big programs like Steinlager or the first challenge for the America's Cup would have ever got off the ground. PJ is not only the voice of our sport, but also priceless in getting it recognised and integral in where it is in New Zealand today. Russell Coots said, when people ask me why New Zealand has so many good sailors, I say, Peter Montgomery. The fact that he promoted the sport so well with such an exciting tone of voice, it simply inspired a whole generation. Seriously, without Pete, none of Team New Zealand would have happened. His words, the excitement he created, has a huge influence on my career, as I'm sure it did for many others. Another America's Cup legend, a dear friend of our family, Tom Whidden, asked me to read the following on his behalf. Peter Montgomery is often referred to as the voice of the America's Cup for New Zealand, but really he is the voice of the entire America's Cup universe. He is well respected by every America's Cup sailor I know. His extensive knowledge of sailing and the America's Cup game is recognised around the world and his distinctive voice and colourful, enthusiastic commentary is infectious and always leaves you wanting more. In my mind, Peter has set the bar for all sports commentary. <laughs> Taxi. <laughs> Peter's rise to fame has paralleled New Zealand's rise in America's Cup dominance. At this point, I can't imagine one without the other. It's been said that Peter's celebrity is often greater than the athletes he follows. I regret not being with you tonight to honour Peter alongside all of you. However, it is with great pleasure, Peter, I want to tell you how deserving you are of this honour and how very proud I am of you. But most of all, I want you to know that you and your wonderful family's friendship has meant the world to Betsy and me. And I am abundantly honoured to be your friend, to stand alongside you in the America's Cup Hall of Fame. Congratulations. So, we know that he's a good commentator and he's the voice of the America's Cup but he's also a very excellent human. There's an old saying that you should never meet your heroes, but I'm related to mine. It is with immense pride and honour I would like to introduce the second inductee to the America's Cup Hall of Fame tonight, my dad, Peter John Montgomery. Stay here. Please come on stage. So on behalf of the America's Cup of Fame and the Erasure of Mind Museum, Peter Montgomery is a new inductee in this great organization. Well done. So I present you, come here. Come, come in the front. Come here. <laughs> so this is a model of Reliance, 1903, the most impressive boat in America's Cup history. We also a bottle of champagne. As you know, Mem Champagne is our partner, so Put that in the other hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I would like to see Claudia to come on stage, please. And also, I would like uh, Commodore Aaron to come on stage because I think 
We would like also to give a little gift to Peter. Please come on stage. PJ, we'd also like to present you with a Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron 150th uh, medallion with uh, rainbow on one side and on the other side is an AC75 representing yesteryear and the current year. Well done, PJ. Good evening. Thank you, Kate, who has heard me tell the story that Winston Churchill once told me, don't drop names. So Kate's doing very well with Tom Wooden and Russell Coots. So I might break the rule as well tonight. Auckland America's Cup 2000 was the first time the America's Cup Hall of Fame induction was held outside the United States, right here at the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. And towards the end of the regatta, I was invited to join the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Halsey Hereshoff, Di Jones, Tom Whidden and Gary Jobson were involved and there may have been others as well. At the time I was told they wanted more diversity and opinion from other parts of the world. I was honoured and became the first person on the Selection Committee from the Southern Hemisphere. There are many more now south of the equator. I start with that background because over the last 20 years I've been part of the rigour, scrutiny and robust discussion by the committee every year to decide who will be inducted and I know what an honour it is to be inducted. When I was advised by our brilliant chairman Steve I'd been nominated and therefore had to stand down, I was shocked, surprised, honoured and uh, that I was even going to be considered. When you look at the members already in the America's Cup Hall of Fame, it's a who's who of the biggest names in world sailing. Because the America's Cup is much more than a sporting event and a sailing event. The America's Cup is international sport's oldest prize and the most illustrious and most elusive prize in sailing. Also in the Hall of Fame are designers, administrators, officials and chroniclers. The America's Cup has a life of its own, and to be only the sixth chronicler is selected from writers, photographers, and broadcasters is a very, very special honour. Thank you to those who initiated the nomination and those in the selection committee who endorsed it. I suspect there are some in the room tonight, and I expect there are some key members of the New York Yacht Club and also from Europe. Thank you to the many people here tonight who have influenced my broadcasting career over 50 years. The latest edition of the America's Cup was my 13th. The first was in Newport, Rhode Island in 1980, after I became hooked on the Cup and its characters back in the 1970s. My great friend Peter Shipway in Sydney, uh, who was crewing on Australia, reminded me yesterday, don't forget it all started back in 1980. I never will, because Shippy opened many doors to a wide-eyed Kiwi, and one day I was in the sail off of Australia when a voice with a cut-through factor gave me a hell of a fright. Who are you? What are you doing here? And I turned around, and thankfully Peter Shipway told Warren Jones, he, he's okay, he's a good friend from New Zealand. And then came uh, Newport in 1980. I thought I'd be supporting Australia forever because New Zealand had a better chance of getting a man on the moon. A challenge for New Zealand for the America's Cup seemed impossible. One, through finance, two, technology, three, lack of experience in big boats. But as most of you on this room will know, or those watching around the world, the 80s was a decade of huge change. And then we came to September uh, the 26th of September 1983, and Australia too broke the longest winning streak in sports history, of which Grant Simmer, by the way, is here, who was in the afterguard of Australia too, is here this evening. That was the first time I... <clears throat> that was the first time I heard, well, if the Aussies can do, why not New Zealanders? You've really got to be an Australia or a New Zealander to understand that rivalry, because when the Aussies fire the Kiwis up, 
but there was still no challenge. And then at the last minute, it was made by a fellow called Mar Marcel Fashler, who lived in Sydney. And yesterday I received an email from Marcel, Dear PJ, what a fantastic series. Exciting, thrilling, nail-biting at times, but at the end, the only thing that counts is winning, and Emirates Team New Zealand did that. It makes me so proud to have been the catalyst on getting New Zealand in the America's Cup back in 1984. My vision paid off, Marcel. But after, after instigating the entry in 1984, Marcel was not able to continue. Others tried, but funding was difficult. And as Michael Fay has alluded to, I was one of the people that maybe talked Michael into spending a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Michael's told me but my eye, how much he thinks it's cost him, and my eyes water when I think about it. And from the 5th of October, 1986, Heart of America versus KZ7, I've been very privileged to broadcast every race Challenger or the match, including Valencia 2010, the only America's Cup New Zealand was not competing in since Fremantle. In Fremantle, Stars and Stripes against Kukapara and my first analyst in the America's Cup match was Buddy Melgers, who was fun and outstanding analyst, but his sense of humour was great. I come from Zender, Wisconsin. It's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there, Buddy would tell me often. <laughs> And then we had the 88 Big Boat Deed of Gift Challenge, San Diego 92, and then in America's Cup 29, San Diego 95, it was Black Magic against Team New Zealand. Peter Blake and a special leadership and excellent team worked to a tight budget. PJ Blake often replied to a request to spend money they did not have and asked, will it make the boat go faster? The 95 campaign learned some valuable lessons from the past, especially from Dennis Connor and his Stars and Stripes Challenge, where not to waste your time and money, work to what you have, don't dream or wish uh, what you don't have or can't have, meaning I wish we had six weeks when you've only got six days. The America's Cup is a game of change and it is a game of life. And so we got to Auckland 2000 when the first time the America's Cup was sailed in New Zealand. And what a privilege that was from North Star with Kerry and Mary Kohler. Auckland 2000, 73 days in every race with Chris Law as my wingman. And 77 days in every race in 2003 with Ed Baird alongside. It's been another beautiful day on the Hauraki Gulf is where that started. Back there in those days between 2000 and 2003. And the magnetic attraction of the America's Cup continued with Valencia and then San Francisco and Bermuda. But the America's Cup has opened doors like nothing else. In 2001, the America's Cup Jubilee, it was through Bruno, arranged that I speak on behalf of New Zealand. I emceed the prize giving with royalty and presents, and I accepted Dennis Connor's invitation to sail in the Round the Islet race race. Sailing and broadcasting, uh, commentary just didn't happen until the 1970s and I'm so thrilled and delighted to see my longtime friend Bill McCarthy down here who set the flame for me to uh, set sail and broadcasting and Bill told me the very first day I started broadcasting remember you're talking to the little old lady with a blue rinsed hairdo in Riverton and I've never forgotten that advice and 50 years later the little old lady is still my number one listener another piece of advice was this is from a different broadcaster. Every time you speak, you should lose part of yourself. And I've always remembered that because a broadcaster who doesn't value audience loyalty should be <clears throat> in another line of work. For the last 30 years, New Zealanders have had key roles in broadcast coverage of the America's Cup television, direction and graphics. And I know I shouldn't be mentioning names because there's so many to thank but I notice Ian Taylor and Paul Sharp, the brilliant masterminds behind the graphics we've had over the last couple of weeks are here tonight. It's humbling to see so many faces here tonight and know there are many watching in other parts of the world that cannot be here uh, because of the COVID pandemic. And that has disrupted too much already. And it's disappointing and very frustrating that Ed Baird is not here, as well as the Hirishoff Museum team and our outstanding chairman, Steve. The stunning achievement of a couple of days ago has had many shakers and movers in the chain over the last 30 years. Emirates Team New Zealand, the representative team of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, have become the first team in the squadron, the first yacht club, 
to successfully challenge and defend the America's Cup twice. San Diego 95, Auckland 2000, Bermuda 2017, and now in Auckland 2021, setting a new standard uh, in the this 36th edition. But without Michael Fay and his partner David Richwhite, none of this could have happened. Michael Fay laid the foundation that has become a four-peat. Tonight is a special honour I treasure with my family, Johnny and Kate. We've had some very special experience, experiences only the America's Cup can give. I think going to Fighter Town for a special conducted tour, even without Tom Cruise, in Fighter Town USA was very special. My raps in 95 and 2000 were ad lib, doing my best to pull the words out of the air to match the occasion. But in 2017 and 2021, I wanted to ensure the raps were linked back to 95 and 2000. I made some notes and then I decided we should use Kate's uh, honours degree in English and make, to make great suggestions that were broadcast. A very special thank you to Claudia, who somehow has coped when I've had my broadcasting came on. It's been an honour to broadcast 13 editions. <laughs> I can assure you when I've had my broadcast game face on, I'm not necessarily the nicest person to be around. I'm too busy thinking about the next line, the next word, and uh, all about the light and intonation. It's been an honor to broadcast 13 editions of the America's Cup and to tell stories of the races and competition, plus the intrigue ashore. Do what you love and love what you do. It's an honor to be inducted into the America's Cup Hall of Fame. The America's Cup, there's nothing like it in sport. Thank you. It is really a great addition to the Europe fame. But I want to say something. His claim, this is another beautiful day on the Iraqi Gulf, was wrong. In 2003, we missed 10 days of racing. <laughs> While this year, we didn't miss any day. One day in Christmas Cup. So thank you very much. Well done. We are very happy. It's time now to honor the inductees. So first is Ed Bird. We play a video about Ed Bird. Guy Jobson put it together. If success is the measure of a man, then in the sailing world, you can count Ed Baird at the top. Ed grew up in Florida around the water, sailing opties and dinghies and finding success in lasers, winning the Laser World Championship in 1980, the last American to do so. Ed went on to write a book about laser sailing that is still in print today. We had a lot of good people in our yacht club and our, our sailing program here in St. Petersburg. and I. I was just around them a lot, and it just ended up that we were, as a group, actually okay. You know, that was the, the magic that got us to, uh, to good places. The 1995 Rolex Yachtsman of the Year is routinely described as ever enthusiastic and ever optimistic. Over his career, Ed has found success from J24s to TP52s, but Ed's interest in match racing had a peculiar beginning. I actually went to the Bermuda Gold Cup as a commentator uh, way back when, and before I had ever match raced, I went there and did a, an ESPN show about the event and watched, uh, you know, Coots and Gilmore and Chris Dixon and all those guys go, go sail. And I looked at it and I said, this looks like a lot of fun. I think I could do this. With his newfound enthusiasm for match racing, success quickly followed. Match racing just became a natural. I understood the rules pretty well. I understood the tight situations. Really puts a highlight on good crew work on the boat and uh, you know, starting, getting off the starting line well. So we have a lot of fun with that. Robust competition on the water between Ed and Russell Coots led to an invitation to join Team New Zealand as a sparring partner and coach for their 1995 America's Cup campaign in San Diego. The team went on to sweep Dennis Conner and his team five to zero. 
I had met Russell Coots at that Laser Worlds, and I had been racing against him for several years and uh, on the match race circuit. And you know, we had a, a good back and forth between us. Um, and when they were putting together their team, they, they just he, uh, we actually ran into each other one day at the Admirals Cup and cows. Uh, walked around the corner of a building and, and ran into each other. And he said, what are you doing for the cup? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, well, you should come work for me. And I was like, okay. With 11 teams competing to challenge New Zealand in 2000, Ed teamed up with the New York Yacht Club and the Young America campaign. It was a team rich with experience and potential. We had a really tough uh, set of circumstances. You know, we were, we, the boat broke on the roughest day of sailing that we had in the entire cup cycle and we happened to be on the outer course that day which was rougher than anywhere else and we just happened to be in a position where we, we hit some waves the wrong way and, and the boat failed. For the 2003 America's Cup Challenger trials, Ed shifted his expertise to the broadcast booth as a TV analyst. This opportunity gave Ed a surprising new perspective on America's Cup racing. Watching the races and listening on board, you got a feeling for what was going on within all these teams. And it just gave me a huge amount of confidence on the things that I understood well. But it was, it was a real eye-opening experience to be able to, to watch every race from every team. For the 2007 Cup Challenge, Ed teamed up with Ernesto Bertarelli, Brad Butterworth, and the Alinghi campaign to challenge Team New Zealand. This well-funded and deeply talented team beat New Zealand 5-2 in a dramatic series, one of the most memorable in America's Cup finishes. This is too close to call the seventh match. What a way to finish this extraordinary... Blowing 14 looked like a pretty just straightforward sail down the run to the finish line. But before we finished, we had about a 120-degree shift, and they got past us. So fortunately, they still had the penalty to do and didn't quite get it done, and we crossed ahead. Baird has been fortunate to spend his entire career as a professional sailor. Sailing runs deep in the Baird family. Ed's sons are competitive sailors, with Nick named the 2019 College Sailor of the Year from Yale University. He's been competing with his father's old teammate, Tom Stark, aboard the IC-37 Rush. These days, it's his family's success in the water that truly enriches Ed Baird. It's been fabulous to see the, my sons get it going in the sport. And, you know, my wife, who doesn't really sail, uh, has been around the sport so much that she really understands it pretty well now. And just the whole family atmosphere of it, we've all helped each other do better. And I, I think that's been a real special thing. I will now invite uh, Brad Butterworth to say a few words about Ed. Thank you, Bruno. I've got more than a few words to say about Ed. Ed, I uh, sent a note off to Ed, asked him what I should talk about him, and he said a whole lot of stuff about how well he's done. It's quite embarrassing how many championships he's won, how well, how successful he's been. He's won just about everything. And uh, when uh, I got to know him, we were sailing match racing with uh, Russell and Warwick and Dean Phipps and a few of the other guys. He was one of the hardest guys to beat and a difficult character, but all the time he was a gentleman. When he joined us in 95, he was a coach. He liked to be called the coach because he's done a hell of a lot of work with uh, coaching kids and stuff like that. And he, I think he's one of the best coaches in the world yet. And he's, uh, he came to us, but of course he was coaching us guys and we were sort of uncoachable because um, it's quite a few difficult characters, some of them sitting me on the back. <laughs> anyway, he was the helmsman of the other boat and he did a hell of a job. And uh, we were sailing two boats with short crews in 95. We had the shore crew out there sailing with us and uh, sailing very well and testing things. And as we went through the competition, it was, you know, quite amazing to see the development of the boats. Ed, what, Ed couldn't sail on the boat because there was a residency or a nationality um, rule, which, you know, continues to this day. 
Anyway, uh, one, one day he came out as a spectator or the 17th man on the back and we were racing the Australians and we went around the bottom mark and sheeted on and went through a few big waves and the guys eased the sails and I was looking to leeward and they snapped in half and sunk. And uh, Ed, Joey Allen came up the back hatch after pulling the spinnaker down. He said, uh, looked around, he goes, where are those guys? You guys are bloody good. And I said, they've sunk, Joe. <laughs> and at that stage, Ed was, we were talking, we were actually having an argument in the back of the boat with Peter Blake and Ed was at the back there and Russell was steering the boat over what we should do next, whether we should stop or ease up or how we should go. Actually, Ed was good and just wanted to, uh, to keep the boat sailing and keep it on its feet. So it was, that was one of the stories from 95. Also, he, you know, in between that, he he, he didn't he got he sailed for the New York Yacht Club, and then he came and was on a TV here and uh, did a hell of a job. Beside some other guy who talked about liquid Himalayas and blowtorch on your shorts and other stuff that wasn't really relevant. I can't remember his name. In two thousand and seven, obviously, we had a, a you know a tough. Uh, Regatta against Team New Zealand. We were sailing for a lingi. Rustler left the team, and we'd, uh, as a group, we decided Ed. We asked Ed to join us, and actually, the one of the poignant moments of my career is that we were sailing up the final beat of, I think it was race seven, and we were set up in a perfect position to dial Team New Zealand. Obviously, we know what happened, but Ed wasn't that happy about that because he we'd been training it, but not enough, and in the end. I said, oh, well, you can do this, man. He goes, yep, I can do it. And if there's one thing that happened perfectly that day, he did that manoeuvre perfectly. And that's the sort of guy he was. He was He's a real tradesman at his art. He is an unbelievably talented sailor in sailing a boat perfectly. So I've got a couple of things about him. He's, he's honest. He's hardworking. He's got, he fits into a team culture with no problem. He's technically, I think, excellent. Murray wouldn't agree because they were always arguing about which end of the start line to start. Sail testing, he could sail a boat for 10 minutes at a time within half a degree. A lot of, there's only a few guys in the world that could do that. He's practiced culture. He'd practice, we'd practice until we got it right. And the other thing is he's a, I think he's a solid citizen. He has a, a great family. He has tremendous report, uh, support from his wife, Lisa, and his kids, Max and Ty and Nick. And I know Lisa, I've seen it firsthand, and she had to come to Spain and set up shop. Not easy with a young family, and she's done a, a hell of a job. So he's an asset to any group that, would, that he could be with. He's been a great friend and a fantastic teammate. And I welcome him into the Hall of Fame. Thank you. So obviously, Ed cannot be here tonight. He's an American and couldn't fly in. So I will ask Aaron to come on stage and present a, a gift to Brad Butterworth on behalf of Ed Bird. You can put the bubbles. Can you tell us what it is? Can you tell us what it is? So to um, Ed, well, Brad said he's going to keep the bubbles. But there is a Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron 150th medallion here. We've only made 150 of these, so now we've got 149 left. And this is going all the way to the US. Well done, Ed, and uh, thanks, Brad. That's okay. It's rainbow, by the way. <laughs> so Ed had recorded the video yesterday. So now we play the acceptance speech by Ed Bird from America. Brad, thanks for your kind words and for being such a great friend for so many years. Good evening to everyone who's come to this wonderful ceremony tonight. Lisa and I are really disappointed that we can't be there, but we'll celebrate with you here in Florida and raise a glass with you all. Congrats to Emirates Team New Zealand for winning this America's Cup. We watched from afar and enjoyed the battle, but we can't wait to be part of the next cup in person. Some of you may know that I have a long history with New Zealand, Auckland, and the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. 
when I started match racing, the bigger events only invited sailors who were ranked or were America's Cup helmsmen. There were no qualifier events, just 10 invited skippers. Basically, it was the same 10 all the time. I wasn't ranked and I had never done the cup, so I was uninvitable until the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron took a chance on me for the 1991 Steinlager Cup. My Kiwi friend, Richard McAllister, convinced Rob and Dean Salthouse to sail with Joe Fordney and myself so we could keep travel costs low. We ended up winning and suddenly I started getting invited to other events. Thank you, Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. As my career in match racing developed, so did my relationships with many New Zealanders. I often raced against Sir Russell Coots and his famous team of Warwick Flurry, Simon Dobney, Dean Phipps and Brad Butterworth. They were tough and we were still learning, but we had some great battles. In 1993, we raced against each other in the finals of the Match Race Worlds in Perth. The racing was close and hard. Uh, we even had one race declared a dead heat. Coots and his team won the event, but we gave him a good fight. The next year, Russell asked me to be part of Team New Zealand for the 1995 America's Cup as his training partner and coach. As you know, that was a historic team with a terrific result. Thank you, New Zealand. I returned to Auckland late in 95 and with a mostly Kiwi team, won the match race world championships. New Zealand continued being kind to me. The cup experience with Sir Peter Blake, Russell, Brad and the incredible talents of Team New Zealand taught me a lot. And I was invited to be the skipper of the New York Yacht Club's team, Young America. We worked hard to prepare to take on my former teammates in the 2000 Cup. It wasn't to be though, as New Zealand had some other plans for me. On November 9th, 1999, the big waves of a strong northeasterly proved too much for our boat and we broke in half. We were able to save the boat, but our scoreline suffered and we didn't make it to the America's Cup. In 2003, I didn't have any good opportunities to race in the Cup but I was honored to be included on the broadcast team to cover the racing on the Haraki Gulf. I spent the whole cup cycle working alongside an America's Cup fixture named Peter Montgomery and with the award-winning crew at Television New Zealand. Having never done live TV before, it made sense for me to seek advice from the best. So I asked Pete Montgomery, how could I be most effective in my role as commentator? His advice was simple. He pointed to Takapuna and he said, up there in one of those houses is a grandma who doesn't know much about sailing, but she knows this is a big event, so she's watching. Explain it well to her and everything else will take care of itself. Thanks, PJ. As everyone knows, you're a legend. 2003 was great for my teams. Uh, we did well in match racing. Ultimately, we won the world championships that year. Uh, late in the year, Brad Butterworth invited me to join the Alinghi team, which led to winning the 2007 America's Cup. So as you may have deduced, the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, Auckland, and New Zealand have played a prominent role in my racing history. Without you, I wouldn't have had the experiences and the successes that I have. Thank you. But wait, there's more. Throughout my career, my wife, Lisa, has done an amazing job of raising our family, encouraging me to reach for the next goal and somehow finding tolerance for my travel schedule and crazy work hours. She's a huge part of why I'm here tonight and I wanna thank Lisa Baird. Many others deserve my thanks and appreciation the St. Petersburg Yacht Club for introducing me to our great sport, my parents for encouraging me to race, my teammates, my many teammates over the years for their hard work and support. While not part of my America's Cup activities, I'm also greatly appreciative to Doug DeVos, who is attending tonight and is owner of the American Magic Team. For a decade, Doug has included me on his quantum racing team, the most successful TP52 team in history. 
I'd like to thank Ernesto Bertarelli and the Société Nautique de Genève for trusting me to drive a lingi. I'd like to thank the New York Yacht Club, John Marshall and Tom Stark for including me on the Young America team. And of course, the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron and the late Sir Peter Blake for giving me my America's Cup start on Team New Zealand. Winning the America's Cup is one of the world's greatest sporting challenges. I feel very lucky to have been part of that history. It's a great privilege to accompany Pete Montgomery as we join such a terrific group of America's Cup personalities and legends in the Hall of Fame. Thank you for this honor. Enjoy your evening, and I hope to see all of you on the water again soon. So as we all know, well, I hope you all know that the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron accepted a challenge from the Royal Yacht Squadron. Uh, when was it now? <laughs> Wednesday afternoon. Just checking. Um, and we are genuinely very, very happy, very proud to have accepted that challenge from, you know, I guess the club that started the America's Cup with New York. And for us, this is quite a special moment to. Uh, you know, welcome the Royal Yacht Squadron while they are still here representing Ineos Team UK. And to start that, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Bertie Bickett. Bertie is the uh, Chairman of Royal Yacht Squadron Racing and also uh, Grant Simmer. As PJ said earlier, Grant's sort of actually been there, done that in the America's Cup from 83. And I'm going to invite Grant and Bertie up here just to say a few words around what they see and what they hope and what they look for as challenger record for America's Cup 37. Well, listen, uh, just a big thanks for having us, Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, um, New Zealand. It's been an amazing time here. America's Cup, a friendly competition between yacht clubs. <laughs> let's, let's keep it that way. So for us, it's a, just a huge honor um, for the first time in our history to be challenged a record. Having said that, of course, the form book doesn't really read too well because no challenger of record has ever won this thing here. I'm sorry, Jim, I should have told you that before. <laughs> so look, we're looking forward to uh, repatriating this thing here back to Kanazala Wood, the birthplace of the America's Cup. Thank you. All right. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to apologize that um, Ben couldn't be with us tonight. He had something come up on very short notice. And on behalf of everyone in the INEOS team, I'd like to say well done to the Italian team, the Luna Rossa boys. <laughs> the Luna Rossa boys sailed the hell out of that boat and uh, it was really impressive to watch. And then, of course, Team New Zealand, um, they just do it time and time again. They put together a good design program, execute it beautifully, and then sail the, sail the boat better than all of us dream of. So, uh, well done to Team New Zealand. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, so the next cup, you would have read a bit of press about that. The, the plan is use the same boats again. Um, and um, I, think, I think there's a fair bit of talk to things that we can do to make those boats even better. Uh, and I'm you know, looking forward to being part of that. We, uh, we want to find a way to get more teams involved in the Cup. And obviously, it's some meaningful ways of reducing the cost of competition to encourage new teams in. And um, you know, it's been two days since since Team New Zealand won and obviously accepted our challenge. 
and we've got to figure out a uh, proposal that's going to span the next few years. And uh, we really don't have a lot more detail than that. I know that skeptics will be <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> but that is the fact. And uh, so we're going to work on that over the next couple of weeks and uh, try and engage the other teams in that process as we go. Yeah, uh, just to finish off our thanks for being such fantastic hosts. Um, a memorable, a memorable time here. Um, looking forward to being back very soon. And just on behalf of the Royal Yacht Squadron, a small gift for you of a print of the castle, um, actually done in the year of the birth of the America's Cup. From us, thank you very much. I would like to invite Jim Ratcliffe, the chairman and president of INEOS, the main backer, the only backer of uh, Team INEOS to come on stage to tell us a few words about his experience here in New Zealand. Jim Ratcliffe. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I should start with an apology, really, because I'm without question the most underqualified person to have stepped on the stage this evening. Um, because there weren't many sailors in my housing estate in Manchester. Um, and I had this um, uh, drink, some of you might know, I had, I, I had a drink with uh, Ben Ainsley about three years ago in London. We had a gin and tonic in a, in a bit of a, a rather fancy club called Five Hartford Street. And it, it turned out to be a very expensive gin and tonic, <laughs> and it's just got very much more expensive <laughs> by the looks of things. Um, but the, um, I've been in New Zealand now for nearly three months, and the sort of standout thing for me, having come to New Zealand, has not actually been, funnily enough, the sailing or the scenery. Uh, or even the fishing, which you go on about so much here in New Zealand. But it has been, it's been the people, really. I've, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done my best to sort of get about, and I, I've been up to Cape Renga, and I've been down to, uh, I've been to that pub in Stewart Island. The 408 people in Stewart Island, we went to Stewart Island, it's quite big the island, but there are only 408 people in this little town called Oban. I mean, you, you all know this, of course I didn't know this, but anyway, we went to the pub. There were, it was a Monday evening, and there were 100 people in the pub. <laughs> only 408. But, so I've been all over the place. I've even had a go at diving for crayfish, which I now understand is why you guys are all so tough, because I was, I didn't like battling with lobsters. <laughs> you guys, it's all in your DNA. But, um, but I have to say, all the people that we met in New Zealand, without exception, have been unfailingly cheerful, chatty, welcoming. When we were in the, the pub <laughs> in Oban, I mean, pretty much every table came across and had a chat with us. There was one lovely group who were camping there who, who said, you know, you must get awfully fed up on that boat of yours, bobbing around all the time. If you want, what, what you could, we, we'd be happy to go over to your boat and you could come spend the night in the tents. That'd be... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, everyone has been really, and that is the standout feature for me in New Zealand, I have to say. It's been really, really delightful. And, um, and the one thing, as a sort of business person, because, you know, there's lots of people who work for my, for my Andy's company, INEOS, so we spend a lot of time with people. The one feature of the people in New Zealand that is very noticeable, I think, to us is this can do. You know, I don't know whether it's because, you know, you're a long way from the rest of the world, but you have a very can do attitude. All the people we come across here have a very can do attitude, which is maybe why you're so good at sailing and those other things. But, uh, you know, I, I, really do, I do notice that. But uh, anyway. Back to the sailing, that's my, that, 
clearly is the second standout feature has been the sailing, which I mean, it's been a marvellous event. I've, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, we are, you know, we are very much new entrants here, so it's a sort of a fresh book. But I mean, we've been absolutely captivated by the America's Cup and this AC-75, which is a, I think is a marvellous, you know, it's just so good on the, I mean, you know, we know we, we like the Formula One thing quite a lot, and that really is sort of cutting edge, it's exciting, it spills and thrills and all that sort of stuff. But I really think this formula for America's Cup has been hugely, hugely successful. I think it's, you know, I think it, you know, I don't know. Anyway, if the, if the, the America's Cup stays in this place, I think it will, it will capture the imagination of the younger generation, not, not just people who are sort of pure sailors, um, because, you know, you know, all the younger generation, want to, they find it exciting, they want to foil, all that type of thing. Anyway, um, so challenge of record, uh, if, I, if I can say, we're, we're greatly honoured to become the challenge of record, and we know that's a privilege, and I do hope that, you know, in these years to come, we'll fulfil those, so it's a big responsibility, and we recognise that, but I hope that we'll fulfil those well. I think we're pretty straightforward, we're honest, we... We like good sport, and I think we're sport, you know, good sportsmen. We, I mean, I, I'm just one of those normal blokes who reads the sports page. I'm not particularly a sailor, um, and but you know, we like good honest sport, and um, you know, we've got on well with the people that we met in the in the Kiwi sailing t sailing team. Um, I have to say, one one area where we, I think, we do fall behind is the language in the language. I think. Grant Dalton's language is quite ripe, and I'm going to have to work quite hard to get <laughs> to that sort of level, really. But we'll have a go. Um, well, I can't remember where I was now. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we're delighted to be here. We're delighted to be challenged to record. Um, whilst I do think you're sort of the the all blacks of the sea. I mean, you've been quite dominant in the America's Cup, I think, in the last sort of twenty. 20 or 30 years. Um, so, you know, that's hugely impressive for a nation of 5 million people. Um, and you were very much the, the worthy winners of the cup. That isn't to say that I don't think you're unbeatable because we're going to have a go at that <laughs> when that's cup. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Want to say a few words? First of all, Sir Jim, we look forward to the challenge. Thank you. Our sincere congratulations again to Ed Baird and PJ Montgomery. Truly an honour to be here hosting this event tonight with you here. Well done. To our visitors, New York Yacht Club American Magic in the middle of the room there. What can I say? Um, it could have been, would have been, should have been. We really genuinely hope you're back again. And thank you very, very much for your sportsmanship and hospitality and, and being in Auckland through this time. <laughs> to, uh, to Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli, representing the, I'll get this right, Chiquello Vela della Cecilia. Well done, amazing. I, I can, a lot of people asked me early on in the series, they said, are you surprised? Um, and I spoke to Russell at one point and he said, we'd, we'd rather have our boat, but I think there was a bit of surprise even in his voice at that point. So yeah, it was amazing, a, an amazing event and really you know, well sailed and well competed and um, great to have you here. And to our challenger, new challenger of record, Enios Team uh, UK, I think you, you went from favourites to uh, hating Auckland weather for a little while there. But um, the weather in Auckland is pretty changeable, and you'll probably learn that. But um, thank you very, very much. You, you, as a group, have been absolutely superb to deal with all the way through, and uh, we look forward to continuing that relationship over the coming years. There is uh, one last thing I need to do, and that uh, actually is to acknowledge, where is he? 
over there, Bruno Trublet himself. Bruno, um, as you'll all know, has been in the America's Cup just about forever. Um, that's why he gets a job of looking after media each and every time. And I know it was a bit of a late call up this time, but you know, again, I think he's done a superb job both in the media centre and again tonight. And I'd just like to thank Bruno and invite him on the stage. Not to say anything because he's said enough in the last three months, but uh, just to give him a little a, a token of our appreciation for being here and you're spending some time with us at our club. So thank you very much, Bruno. Bruno, you're welcome back here any time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for your attendance tonight. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, for those leaving New Zealand, I hope you've had a wonderful stay. Wish you safe travels home. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very, very much.